I'm going to call up my colleague Benjamin Ansor, and he's going to have a chat with Mona Elisa from Avangard. Benjamin? Hello. Hi. Welcome. So one of the disadvantages of being behind the stage is you can't actually hear very much, which is a shame because <laughs> that, um, the, the conversation they were just having about custody is obviously directly relevant yeah. um, to, to asset management. So welcome. Um, is it worth you just introducing yourself briefly to the audience and just telling people a, a little bit about Avantgarde? Sure, yeah. Uh, so my name is Mona Elisa. Um, I come from a traditional finance background, so I started most of my career, spent most of my career in traditional finance. I started as a trader at Goldman, market making across uh, in, in European equities, but prop trading across uh, a lot of different asset classes. And in 2011, I left to go and work for a large European hedge fund and ran a long short equity book for them for four years. And in 2014, I left to set up my own hedge fund, which was a complete disaster. <laughs> um, <laughs> not going to lie. Um, and, um, you know, we managed to raise $30 million of assets under management. Um, and uh, what I hadn't really anticipated was how cumbersome the operational and administrative side of things was in the hedge fund space, because uh, everywhere I'd worked previously, um, always sort of took care of that for me in the background. So there I was having to do everything for myself and wondering why everything had to be so complicated. And within a year, I decided that wasn't really how I wanted to spend um, the next chapter of my life. So wound down the fund. And um, I thought I was going to take a year out. But actually what happened is two months into that year out, I read an article about uh, Bitcoin. Um, and I decided that uh, it was interesting, so I dug deeper, discovered Ethereum, discovered something which uh, was referred to as Crypto Valley at the time in Zug, and decided that I wanted to be a part of whatever was happening there, so I took a flight to Switzerland and immersed myself there. And uh, soon afterwards, I was founding my first uh, blockchain-based company, Melonport, which um, that was in August 2016, and that was uh, a company which was um, which built one of the fir first DeFi protocols in the space. It's an on-chain asset management protocol, which used to be called Melon before BNY Melon um, objected to that. Can and sort, of, uh, <laughs> sort of see why. <laughs> uh, spelled differently, though. Um, but um, yeah, in we, we, we've recently rebranded to Enzyme. In 2019, we decentralized the protocol which meant that we, um, we gave up ownership of it and uh, it's now governed by a body of technical experts and user representatives. And uh, in 2000 and uh, shortly afterwards, I founded a new company, which now still does lots of the core development work for the, the governance body uh, that looks after Enzyme. But we're also avant-garde, so avant-garde finance is also building out um, um, uh, ways to make this protocol easier, more transparent and simpler to use um, and hopefully bridging the gap uh, to traditional finance players and retail over time. Thank you. So your journey um, through your career, but particularly your uh, effort to set up your own fund and your sort of sudden discovery of what your operations and administrative colleagues have been doing all that time um, <laughs> is, is a wonderful way to start thinking about some of the challenges facing the traditional uh, asset management and fund management industry. What, what are some of the biggest problems that the industry faces? Because you know, I, I look at the industry and I see uh, you know, sometimes miserable returns for investors, yeah. eaten away by big fees. And you look at that and you look at a lot of the institutions saying, why are the fees so high? Retail investors, very similar. Why can't we have it for free? Mm -hmm. What are some of the big challenges facing established asset and investment management firms? Yeah, so the fees are high, I think, because the, 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 the tech, the, there is the, the asset management stack as it exists today in um, traditional finance is uh, completely non-automated, completely manual, and completely opaque. Um, so in other words, you need to introduce a lot of financial intermediaries into the asset management stack that fulfill certain roles which are typically to protect investors 
um, against any kind of malicious or uh, wrongdoing behavior um, in terms of how their assets are managed. Um, and because its processes are so manual and labor intensive, and because the data we have in modern financial, uh, in today's traditional financial asset is so opaque, uh, this is a lot of effort, a lot of work, and so it feeds into the costs. And, um, and that's why I think, um, I think we have a very, um, yeah, it's, it, I, think, I think finance is probably the last and only industry that hasn't yet been disrupted by technology. Um, and I think have that's... You, have you come across government? Come have across? you come across government? <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay, I'll take it back. Second last, sec second last industry, yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, so like, and I think another, uh, another big thing that plays into this is uh, the settlement side of things in traditional finance is still T plus two, T plus three. And so even if you were to have some kind of automated system, you're still receiving settlement late, and so you're receiving data late, and so you spot errors or uh, problems later than you might otherwise if settlement was immediately. And this is another big thing that blockchain transforms. Immediate settlement means immediate transparency. So let's talk about how DeFi and blockchain can help with some of these problems. So you've already hinted at some of it with opaque versus transparency and so yeah. on. Um, but perhaps we should start with the, the, the human related problems, because you said part of the challenge is when you've got um, human processes really that exist to protect investors. So how does DeFi help with, with that transparency and that sort of protection of investors? Yeah, so I think if you think about what the traditional asset management stack looks like, you're basically looking at, you have uh, a range of different asset classes, you have a range of different custodians that can look after those assets on behalf of a fund or on behalf of investors. Um, you have um, a fund admin typically that will take care of NAV calculations, will take care of uh, making sure that you're sticking to the rules within your fund prospectus and that you're not um, using investors' funds to go and buy a yacht, but rather using them to invest in, if your fund is a U.S. equities fund, to invest in U.S. equities. You have uh, trading and settlement, uh, you have um, the execution partners, you have, um, at an internal level, you have to have operations that can support all of that, and administrators, and then service layer on top. Um, so that's already, I didn't, I lost count, but six or seven There's a lot of complexity. intermediaries, yeah. and that's what weighs into the fees. Um, the DeFi stack is uh, achieving exactly the same goal, but instead of using financial intermediaries, it's using smart contract code, which is enforced by blockchain technology. So, um, for example, on the custody layer side of things, there isn't really a concept of custody unless you opt into custody when it comes to crypto, because the whole point of crypto, at least initially, was to was to foster this idea of self-custody. That you hold your own assets, yep. Your asset, your key, your assets. And yes, that's not, I know many of you in the room might argue, well, what if you lose your key and that's dangerous, etc. But that's why you have multi-sigs, that's why you have solutions like Credo, that's why you have solutions like uh, Fireblocks, etc. Uh, so that, you know, you can manage wallets more like organizations with governance layers on top of them. Um, at the fund admin level, you know, we talked about being able to enforce rules and going behaviors on managers in a manual way. In the smart contract world, you would take a protocol like Enzyme, for example, and I, w I could set up a fund with a few clicks and say, okay, this fund can only invest in this specified asset class. Um, it's only allowed to take, um, it's only interact allowed to interact with these DeFi protocols and it's only allowed to take this much exposure as a maximum size position. And all of those rules are embedded in code. They might also be in a, in a, in a wordy contract, but they're, in, they're embedded in code. And so if I try to act outside of that framework, the trade will just get rejected automatically. Um, so there's no, there's no way of, um, uh, no, no humans have to really uh, intervene at any point. And you can, you can have guaranteed and actually probably much more efficient security around what's happening because all of this stuff is happening in real time and monitored in real time as well. It's interesting this point about humans, isn't it? Because if we think about 
a lot of the catastrophes that have hit the traditional asset management industry over the years, it's often a human. It's an individual fund manager or a trader or whatever who starts to get into a hole, who tries to you know, double down and double down and double down, or whatever. Or you know, someone just shuffling yeah, a few it's things. Innocent. Sometimes, you sometimes it's innocent. Sometimes you book a buy as a sell by accident, and then you discover it a week later. And yeah, or the fat or finger where there's a, you know. Um, how does DeFi help with that? Do you see ways that you can reduce the human risk of either genuine mistakes or sort of Madoff type pyramid schemes? So on the malicious side of things, you know, when somebody is intentionally breaking, you know, protocol, I think that's where smart contracts can be very powerful. Um, I don't think that uh, uh, smart contracts can necessarily help as much uh, as much with accidental er errors. Um, they might even be, um, you know, a fat finger is a fat finger. There's no there's no real way to fix it, whether it's in in you know in the DeFi world or the CFI world. Um, but yeah, I think on, on, on kind of um, controlling certain behaviors and enforcing certain behaviors, I think smart contracts um, and protocols like Enzyme can be much, much more efficient at guaranteeing your, um, your, yeah, your control over, over the assets. So when we think about um, sort of DeFi and asset management, we naturally think of crypto assets because it's the obvious place yeah. to start. Um, but one of the basics of investing is to diversify your assets. And so a lot of investors, certainly mainstream investors, whether we're talking about pension funds or ordinary retail investors, have a variety of assets. And of course, they're increasingly interested in crypto assets, but they also have some traditional assets, you know, property or equities or whatever. Will we, will we start to see sort of tokenization of traditional assets? Because presumably that, that has to happen for those assets to move into a DeFi world are we starting to see that happen? I believe we will see it. I think we're seeing smaller examples of it. Um, but the challenge with the types of assets you're talking about, and most of them are classified as securities, and securities transfer law is very, very complicated. Or actually, it's very complicated, but more importantly, it was not built for a DeFi world, for an on-chain world. All the rules and regulations around security transfer were built with this idea of financial intermediaries in mind. So if you go to a regulator and say, well, I can actually have the same result, but it's going to be smart contract run, they'll say, but you know, you still need to have a custodian, you still need to have a fund admin, you still need to have a settlement partner, you still need to have. And so this makes um, the adoption of securities, on-chain securities, I think is what you're referring to, yeah. much, much um, slower. Um, but there's a lot of people trying to figure that out, and I think we will eventually see that. Um, it's just happening a little bit slower uh, than everyone would have liked. Because in some cases, the underlying legislation has to be rewritten, has or at least up. the regulations yeah. have to be rewritten because they were created for a different world. Exactly, yeah. 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 Okay, so obviously this will start first with DeFi. Where are, we s where are we starting to see um, companies embracing um, crypto, uh, sorry, smart contracts and better ways of settling um, transactions? Where are we starting to see this new DeFi stack starting to be used? So interestingly, I think the events of the last few months have been eye-opening for a lot of firms. Um, you know, seeing a lot of losses incurred in in firms on the DeFi front because their operations administrative um, processes when it came to crypto and DeFi just weren't robust enough. And they weren't robust enough because they didn't have enough transparency into their own organizations. And we saw this with um, Celsius, we saw this with Three Arrows Capital, we saw this with uh, various different examples. And I think people are now thinking, oh, okay. You know, there was this narrative at the very beginning which uh, came out which said, oh, you know, DeFi causes massive losses. And actually, no, 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 no. It wasn't DeFi that causes these losses. It was actually the lack of transparency, ironically, i.e. TradFi, CFI ways of doing things that led to these um, disasters. Let's dig into that. Why... I mean, why couldn't they see it? I mean, that's you know, such a sort of basic of managing your assets is understanding what you've got. Um, 
why could they not see? So, uh, talk a little bit more about the opacity. Can I say opacity? Is it opa opaqueness? Uh, <laughs> why was it hard for people in those organizations to see what was really happening? Because they were giving control of uh, assets to individuals in their firms. They didn't have, um, they didn't have, um, in order to interact with DeFi, most, um, the only way to do it is to give, uh, well, either to do it from a multi-sig, but then it becomes very slow, very inefficient, and you probably uh, will time out of most trades before you actually get to sign. Um, so the only other way to do it is to give a single person within your organization uh, control of a bunch of assets and say, okay, manage DeFi. That's step one. So that's already an operational risk, right? Uh, what if that person loses the key? What if that person compromises the key? What if that person sends those assets to his or her personal wallet? Um, there's a lot of things that could go wrong there. Secondly, uh, DeFi, unless you're using um, a purpose-built DeFi asset management software, is very intransparent. So I know that sounds a little bit ironic because blockchain is supposed to bring, bring transparency, right? And that's true, but it's very easy to see current states on blockchain, on chain. But what's really difficult is to audit historical state mm -hmm. on blockchain. So if you want to actually see, you know, in a in a user-friendly, easy way, what transactions has this person done over the last week or month? Uh, what is their PNL and all their DeFi? How much leverage do they have? You will not be able to figure that out from a single wallet address. Um, it will probably take your accounting team weeks, maybe months, to like figure out what has happened, how much leverage they've taken, and that's what's happened in a lot of these cases. You know, these, you know, there was a race for yield. People were under pressure to deliver that yield, and often that yield was generated by taking uh, crazy, stupid amounts of leverage, which were not easily uh, transparent. By contrast, if you're using a purpose-built software. Um, like what we do with Enzyme is we run seven subgraphs underneath the protocol, uh, which support the protocol, which index all the historical trades and transactions, which enable real time and historical reporting, which is auditable on chain. Um, could we um, could we bring up the DeFi stack chart? Because I think it would probably help if if we can project that up on there. Can we can we get that on the big screen? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. I don't know if you can see that behind your head. So yeah. So <laughs> I guess. Um, yeah, when you look at, you know, w in contrast, when you look at the DeFi stack, you know, you have a settlement layer, which is actually the blockchain. You have, uh, instead of using a custo custodian and paying 25, 50 basis points fees, you're using uh, a wallet like Gnosis Safe, which has just been rebranded to Safe, MetaMask, Institutional, Credo, Fireblocks, whatever. Um, you have digital assets as your uh, asset layer. And then you have a protocol like Enzyme that basically takes care of share issuance when you have an investment redemption, uh, NAV accounting, which is provable and auditable on chain, reporting, risk management, investment rules, execution, collateral management, etc. cetera. Um, and then you can, um, all of this so far, by the way, is without touching a financial intermediary. This is all just code uh, enforced by blockchain. Um, and then you can interact with DeFi protocols. Some of those have fees, but so do exchanges. So we're not, you know, we're not any worse off than TradFi so far. And um, and then all all of this is automated. No humans are needed, and it's completely transparent and real time. And you need a very slim layer on the top if you're in traditional finance uh, service layer. I would call it to add some compliance, maybe and. Um, and also maybe to integrate with more uh, commonly used uh, softwares uh, that, that traditional finance companies would use. And so you're saying that the, the DeFi stack is much cheaper to operate or will be much cheaper to operate because essentially you're automating far more of it. So there's less human, less risk of human error um, and less human involvement. Therefore, it's, it's cheaper and more efficient and hopefully l lower risk. Yeah. Um, that's one side of it, uh, but also I think it's really important to uh, um, to stress the, the the simplicity and the transparency, which you just don't get in in TradFi. Um, and I I will go back to you know sharing a little an a couple of anecdotes from when I did have that mm -hmm. year off as a fund manager. Um, you know, you get these. You know, anyone who works with a fund administrator will get a NAV report at the end of every day, or every week, or every month, depending on what your agreement is. 
And making any sense of that NAV report um, almost always doesn't match what your internal calculations will, will say. And you've got to waste hours uh, checking why that is. You know, did you book a trade wrong? Did someone in your company book a trade wrong? Uh, did you um, miscalculate an FX hedge? Was it, you know, was it, um, uh, was it because the futures traded later than the equity market? What was the cause of the PNL discrepancy? And you know, often it takes a couple of days to find out and to adjust the PNL statement to the point where both the fund manager and the administrator agree. Because there's two sources of truth. There's the, there's the fund manager's operational records and then there's the administrator's or custodian's and records. And you have to wait two days for the settlement right. to know the source of truth. So sometimes the fund manager could be saying, no, I didn't do that trade. Um, but then you know, two days later, the trade settles. And, or, or I definitely did a buy, not a sell. And then oh, the sort of fat finger error. And then by the time yeah, yeah. you know the, the 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 trade data comes in, you realise actually no, he was wrong. He hadn't slept well. He made a mistake. You know, and and then it's too late. So I think that's really really important and powerful because, as you alluded to before, a lot of the big um, losses that have occurred in traditional finance over the last decades have been partly because of malicious, but very often because of innocent mistakes, human error. And it happens, and it also, by the way, happens on the financial intermediary side. There's a lot of human error. So being able to automate that is, yes, much cheaper, but also much more powerful for transparency. Why does transparency matter? Asset management is probably one of the highest regulated industries in the sector because we keep seeing time after time uh, market participants being abused, yep. right? And the irony is, in my mind, is we keep enhancing adding more regulation, thicker regulations, and are we actually um, reducing the amount of, um, uh, um, are we actually protecting investors more with all of this regulation? Because I think we're not. I, th I think actually the enforcement against bad actors in finance is pretty poor because you can't see any of the data. You can't actually discover you know, when something is going wrong. Whereas the irony is in this kind of DeFi world, you can, because you have such real-time transparency, because you can audit things so easily, the irony is that you actually can spot malevolent beha um, bad behaviors much, much quicker in real time for lo much less resources, and therefore, you also need less regulation. Because it, I mean, someone like Bernie Madoff, you know, it was years yeah. before anyone spotted it. Um, I actually, one of the first blog posts I ever wrote when I got to this into this space was how Bernie Madoff could have been avoid, how, how <laughs> it could have been avoided, avoided by the use of smart contracts. Yeah. And we haven't really talked about the real-time element, and so I just want to emphasize that because you, you talked a lot about the transparency, but it's also because it's real-time, it's more transparent. Yeah. Yeah. We've got a couple of questions have come in from um, the audience. It's opacity, thank you. Um, <laughs> Uh, why is it difficult to see historical states of the blockchain? Can't we train a machine to build that, that reporting? Um, yes, we can. Uh, we, we can. We can query that data using technologies like um, the graph or covalent, etc. But you do have to build out the infrastructure to do so, which is what we've done. Um, it does not exist at a wallet level, um, and it would be a huge amount of work to build it at a wa wallet level too, because you'd have to um, you'd have to build it for every single DeFi protocol, um, and it would cost a lot of money. But that I mean, that's ultimately what Enzyme is purpose built for asset management, not just for storing assets. And therefore, we've built that um, infrastructure. Um, the challenge we have had is scaling uh, the amount of data that we're collecting, and so we had to split our one subgraph into se seven subgraphs in order to handle the scaling. Um, but it's all, you know, we, we, you know, that's what we've been doing since 2016, finding solutions to these those sort of challenges. Uh, another member of the audience asked if we can have the CFI def DeFi diagram back up on the big screen. Is that possible um, for the folks at the back to bring up the big s uh, the slide again, please? Um, thank you. And then there was another question here about um, how do we make this feel uh, more accessible to more retail investors, right? So one of the big challenges, obviously, for DeFi is how do we broaden this out to more mainstream investors? Um, and part of the question uh, was about you know, the different rates of fees and so on, and it being hard to see fees and so on. Yeah. How, do, how does this help make mainstream investors feel more confident? I mean, again... Um 
we go over and beyond in Enzyme to try and make sure that all the information is available at an interface level and easy to digest, how much fees are being charged, management fees, performance fees, what rules are embedded in, the in, each, in each fund or each vault. Um, and you know that we do all of that to help investors have transparent information. But in terms of making retail investors feel safer, I guess additional things that can be done is um, education. I think that there's, um, unfortunately, because DeFi has been such a big buzzword in the last year and a half, um, there's a lot of mis-selling, there's a lot of products that yeah. go out and sell themselves as DeFi when they actually have nothing to do with DeFi. And it's, it's, it's really been quite maddening. And the other thing is that DeFi sort of, um, DeFi kind of has, at least at, at a certain point, became about who can get the biggest yield rather than the infrastructure and who can take the most risk. And that's, that's again, mis-selling, it's miseducation. That's not what DeFi is, that's certainly not why I got into DeFi. I mean, yield is only a very new thing, it was a new thing, it's, it's dead now, but you know, it, it's, not, it's certainly nothing to do with yield as far as I'm concerned. It's about building the infrastructure of the future, building an automated, transparent infrastructure that will service the future of asset management. There's a great follow-on question or about how far away are the regulations from allowing traditional assets like equities to be managed? Um, what's, your, what's your hunch on how long it might take to get um, traditional assets onto the DeFi stack? Um, my hunch is it will be a long time. Um, well, we know that. How long? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think, um, I mean, I don't know, five to ten years. Five I mean, that, that requires yeah. some pretty big legislative yeah. changes. Yeah. I do think, though, um, maybe in these kind of situations, what happens is someone will figure out a workaround or uh, a way to make it work. Mm. And, and we'll probably see that sooner. Do you think there'll uh, be a market that where it happens faster? Maybe there'll be a particular country, I don't know, Singapore or somewhere that decides to try and make it happen and change yeah, their regulations? Yeah, probably. I think, um, I think we'll see things like real estate come mm -hmm. before equities. It's more, it's more obvious, isn't yeah. it? Because there's more pain and there, perhaps. And we've seen more people coming close to finding workable solutions. Um, yep. Equities, I think, will take a bit longer, but I'm I'm confident that it will eventually happen because it has to happen. Yeah. Um, and also, because with property, of course, you get the advantage you can start dividing that up into smaller shares and so on. So, or art, yeah. uh, you know, some of those other assets. If you tokenize them, suddenly you can more people can own them, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Um, well, we have run out of time. This has been a fantastic chat. Please join me in thanking Mona. <laughs>